Um, hello, everybody. Um, I mean, my name is Juan Bonilla. I'm one of the um, partners of the labor and employment team at Patria Casas. Um, and I'm here with my colleagues uh, Jaime Pavia, who is um, one of our senior associates in the team, uh, who will be presenting with, presenting with me on the webinar today, and also with um, Ana Campos, uh, which is our professional support lawyer, who has been assisting us um, on the whole process for setting up the webinar of today. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for um, sharing um, half an hour with us so that we can update you on the uh, new developments um, and the alternatives that um, we can face and we can um, implement uh, in response to the coronavirus crisis, to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and first of all, I really hope that you, your families, and your teams um, are all um, well, are all, doing well, are all doing well, and are all keeping safe. Uh, because, as you very well know, that is the most important thing right now. Um, and um, that's the same in our team. And um, so we're definitely delighted to, to be here with you. Um, as, a, as a, an initial housekeeping issue, if either of you have any question about the content of the webinar or would like to raise any question, we will always uh, try to give um, a few minutes at the end of the uh, presentation to try to answer any questions that you might want to to to, to ask. Um, the, the, it is as simple as this is an email to webinars at quatracasas.com. That is the um, email address that we have uh, put together in order to um, uh, review this question. So you can either do that while we are on the half an hour webinar, or you can do that also as well. And we will definitely do our best to answer all the questions either uh, right now, um, if time allows us to uh, go back to your questions, um, or if not, we will just um, provide for answers individually, and we will send an email of reply to each of the questions that you might be bringing to us. Um, the content of the webinar of today will be focused on essentially two major issues. Um, one is um, what are the um, steps that a company needs to make if you are still uh, running the operations in a relatively smooth way. Not to say that uh, what happens if your company has not been uh, the business of your company has not been on forced closure based on the uh, regulations by the government and the state of alarm. So that would be the, 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 the part one of the presentation that will be explained definitely more in detail by my colleague Jaime. Um, and then I will uh, then go into the second part of the presentation, which will be more linked to what are essentially the major alternatives as far as government funding programs that you might have available if at some point you are on a forced closure situation or you might be impacted by uh, the state of alarm uh, in one way or another. So first of all, we would uh, we would try to be sort of positive in the way that we want to explain what do you have to do if you are still able to run the operations in a very smooth way. And then I will um, uh, end up and I will uh, transfer to the second part of the presentation where we will be dealing more with the cost-saving alternatives or cost-saving actions that you can take in case uh, there's been any decrease in the business or even the state of forced closure situation based on the state of alarm. Um, so without further ado, um, I will just um, convey to Jaime, uh, my colleague, who will um, be explaining to you what are the different steps, what are the different employment alternatives that you might have to follow uh, if you are still running your operations um, in a smooth way and you are not directly affected or impacted by the state of alarm. Um, just, just to clarify, what we call the state of alarm it is pretty much similar to what in other countries you might refer as to the state of emergency. Um, so it's not like we might use state of alarm because it's more kind of a translation. Um, and we have a state of emergency, which is the next step out of that. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation, and in order to facilitate your understanding, if we talk about a state of alarm or a state of emergency, we will be dealing to the same situation, which is the uh, lockdown situation we're facing at the moment and the impact it may have. So Jaime, um, 
it's all yours. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you, everyone, for joining our uh, webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, as Juan just said, uh, we, we hope that uh, everyone are, are safe and, and well, and we hope that you find this uh, interesting. As Juan uh, has a tool, uh, in my case, I'm going to address um, four main questions that, uh, that should be taken into account regarding the employment uh, perspective um, for those companies that uh, are not directly affected by the declaration of the state of emergency. The first one uh, is what we um, call the main occupational risk prevention measures that companies are obliged to guarantee in, this, uh, in these circumstances, in this exceptional situation. First of all, the prevention service is responsible for managing how the business activity is resumed. Companies must also have a contingency plan uh, for COVID-19 infections to prevent uh, COVID-19 infections. That contingency plan will be applicable not only for their staff, but also for the contractor companies and the self-employing workers that render services at the company's premises. Employees must also receive tailor-made training and information on health and safety measures that should be appropriate to their position. Regarding protective equipment, employees must be provided with a list, mask, gloves, and in those cases that there is a high risk of infections, they should provide with uniforms to, prefer, to prevent that infection. Another important point is that when um, companies resume resumes activity, uh, so employees uh, reinstate to the premises, to the physical premises, employees must keep a physical distance of at least two meters in the working place. Moreover, particularly vulnerable employees must be identified and ensure reinforced protection. If companies cannot uh, guarantee the protection of these vulnerable employees, such employees will be qualified as we, we call a uh, temporary incapac incapacity. Moreover, a specific uh, uh, hygiene measures must be also observed, basically cleaning the premises, uh, air conditioning, and so on. If, the if these safety measures are not fulfilled, in extreme cases, employees, their legal representative, or the social security and labor inspection could even shut down the activity. But I insist in very extreme cases. If the company identifies someone who has been in close contact with a potential or even confirmed COVID-19 case, the prevention services must place that person in, prevent, in, pre, in preventive insulation, basically to safeguard other employees' health. Finally, from the um, health and safety perspective, companies may request their own health service to carry out and adopt medical examinations that can include temporary control. For to do to do so, they have to notify their legal representative if they have uh, them. These measures must be carried out by author, uh, authorized medical staff. The other important question that we have been asked recently is: Where companies are obliged to implement remote working if this option is feasible? The question. The, the answer is yes. As long as it is technically feasible and reasonable for the company, there is a priority to give remote working as an alternative to any other organizational measures to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. In these cases, the government, the Spanish government, has introduced the exceptional uh, obligation that the assess risk will be considered fulfilled by mission of a voluntary uh, self-assessment performed by the employee. The third question that we have been also asked many times is whether companies have to accept the adjustment or reduction of employees' working hours to adapt the working life balance needs arising from 
COVID-19? Again, the, the, the answer is yes. They must negotiate in good faith to reach an agreement with the employee that have requested uh, the adjustment or the reduction. Basically, what the Spanish law says um, regarding these situations, and while the COVID-19 crisis lasts, so it's an exceptional uh, measure as well, is that employees are entitled to request the adjustment or the re re reduction or even both of the working hours to take care of their spouses, partner, as well as blood relative up to the second degree. This request has to be granted as long as they are reasonable and proportionate with respect to the company's needs. Moreover, regarding these situations, in relation to working hour reduction in situation of legal custody, basically, direct care of child, of child uh, under 12 or person with disabilities, the reduction of working hours can be up to 100% of the working day. And the fourth question that I want to address in this part is whether companies make up for the so-called recoverable pay leave. Yes, yes, they can. As you may recall, between March 13th and April 9th, 2020, all companies not providing essential services were forced to close their facilities and work centers and give recoverable pay leave to employees that were unable to work frequently or whose contract had not been suspended under a temporary redundancy plan, what we call ERT. Well, how these accumulate hours have to be recovered was what the Spanish law says, and this is exceptional too, because the recoverable pay leave is an exceptional measure uh, introduced by the Spanish government because of the COVID-19, is that it has to be agreed between the company and the legal workers representative. In case of lack of workers legal representative within the company, the employees have to appoint an ad hoc committee to represent themselves in this case. The company and the representative of the employees have to agree how these hours will be recovered between the end of the state of emergency and December 31st, 2020. This, these are the first questions that I want to, to talk to you about. So Juan, um, I don't know if you want to continue with the next part of, the, of our um, webinar. Sorry, everyone, I was on mute. <laughs> I was just simply talking to myself. Thank you very much, Jaime, for uh, your great um, uh, introduction to the different um, steps uh, those companies who are still uh, running operations in a smooth way have to have to follow. Um, it is particularly important um, to remind all the health and safety measures that Jaime has indicated. And it's also particularly important to have a close uh, contact and a close relationship with the uh, internal health and safety providers at the company, because they would be the ones um, having the final uh, uh, points that every company needs to observe. So um, it's not only to have um, those points um, on the top of our heads, but it's also to be able to discuss them with the health and safety provider um, because the health and safety provider will be the ultimate responsible on all the measures that we need to take. Um, so the, the second part of the webinar today is more aimed to discuss what are the options that uh, every company can take uh, if the operations are not working uh, on a relatively smooth way and are impacted by COVID-19 one way or another. Um, those are part of the, what it's called in other countries, the government funded programs. Um, uh, and, and here, unlike in other countries like the UK, the government is not making a payment directly to the companies 
to support the salaries of those employees who are on a temporary layoff process. But here the government uh, requires the companies to ask for a specific petition um, for assistance. And the request is that this specific petition would include a request to fall off or to lay off uh, temporarily the staff uh, until the situation comes back to normal. And um, again, uh, on a terminology basis, we call full off, we call temporary layoff, we call collective suspension of contracts of employment. Again, it's all the same, um, and it simply reflects the possibility for the companies to request that the employees will not be working, or at least will not be partially working, and the states will be paying unemployment benefits for those employees while they are uh, suspended from their responsibilities to provide work to the company. So uh, for us, full off, temporary layoff, collective suspension of employment contracts, it all means the same thing. The first, the first option is to apply for a temporary layoff due to force mayor measures. Um, and I just simply want to uh, uh, answer three basic questions on that, which is when uh, it is ideal this option, how we can apply for this option, and what are, we, what are the cost savings that any company can get if this petition is successful. Uh, first of all, uh, when it is a temporary layoff based on force majeure issues ideal for a company? It is ideal when the business of a company has been directly impacted by the forced closure of certain businesses. So there's been cancellation or suspension or a strong reaction of activities, uh, particularly in the tourism industry, also on public transportation. Um, uh, there's been there's been also some public venues that also have been forbidden. So anything that is related to the forced lockdown and to the forced closure of an operation or for a business can be included as part of a request for a petition for a temporary layoff due to force mayor. This is different to what we will be calling and we'll be explaining later on, which is the second potential alternative for a temporary layoff, which is a temporary layoff because the productive levels of the company, because the volumes of uh, uh, turnover of the company, the, the orders the company are the company is receiving are lower than uh, the, 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 the orders that the company is receiving uh, uh, prior to the um, COVID-19 crisis. So when you can apply for a temporary layoff due to force majeure, when the business of the company has been directly impacted by the forced closure of their operations as part of the state of emergency, as part of the state of alarm. How we can uh, ask for this government relief program? Well, the company needs to file a, a petition, um, which is a request for authorization by the Labour Authority. Um, this petition includes uh, a specific report which explains and justifies the reasons why we consider uh, uh, the company can apply for a temporary layoff due to force major, which again will have to be linked to the um, cancellation or forced closure of certain activities, and it will also have to include the list of employees that are going to be impacted by the decision. It is uh, important to know that there is no need to negotiate anything with the World councils or anything with the unions or anything with the employees, because this is based on force major, this is based on the forced closure of the business activity of the company. So it is simply as to find this petition with all the supporting documentation, and then the Labour Authority will have five days to respond. It can respond, or the Labour Authority can decide not to respond. If uh, the Labour Authority does not, does not respond, it means that the petition is automatically accepted. Right. So uh, within the five day period, we are either waiting for an express decision by the Labour Authority authorizing the petition or uh, through a lack of response on their side, which will equal to an authorization of the, of the petition um, in exactly the same way. What are the cost savings? The cost savings for the company are number one salaries and the employees will be receiving unemployment benefits and the company will not need to pay the salaries. 
company can discretionarily decide to um, supplement uh, unemployment benefits that the employees will be receiving, but at least there will be some cost savings associated with the fact that payments of the salaries will not need to be made while the uh, temporary layoff is in place. And secondly, uh, social security contributions will also be exempted from this petition. Uh, if the company has less than 50 employees, then the social security contributions will be exempted in full. If the company has more than 50 employees, social security contributions will be exempted 75%. So cost savings again, salary costs in the first place, social security contributions in full or up to 75% in the second place. The second alternative for a temporary layoff is for those companies for whose business activity is not affected by a forced closure, but it's indirectly impacted by the fact that the people or the customers are not uh, uh, consuming the same things and are not spending as much money in the company as they did before the start of the crisis, of the sanitary crisis. Um, Again, okay, a few questions when, how, and what are the cost savings for this alternative? When can you apply for that? You can apply for a petition for a temporary layoff based on productive rounds. When, again, the business orders, the purchase orders the company is receiving are significantly lower than the purchase orders the company were receiving before the start of the sanitary crisis. The aim of this temporary layoff petition would be to try to align the number of employees are actually working to the actual uh, level of work that is required under the current circumstances. In terms of the how, how to file for this petition, here, unlike what we mentioned before for the first major temporary layoff, there is a need to follow a consultation process with the unions, with the worst councils, or with the affected uh, employees uh, on the company. Uh, the uh, difference in between when we have to go to the unions or when to how we have to go to the worst council members or when we have to negotiate with the affected employees will depend on the size of the company, will also depend on whether the company has an employer representation system already in place and it will also depend on the number of work centers that the company is, is, is impacting by this decision. But essentially, the important point is that we need to follow a consultation process, which is as of seven days. Seven days of consultation process, that is the central deviation point from the uh, first alternative that we discussed. In terms of cost savings, the cost savings are again salary cost savings because the employees will be receiving unemployment benefits and the company will not need to pay for salaries while the temporary layoff based on productive rounds is in place. And uh, that's another deviation point in terms of social security contributions. The company will still have to pay social security contributions. The reason for that is because the, it is expected that the temporary scope of this second temporary layoff based on productive uh, reasons will go beyond the end of the state of alarm or the state of emergency. So for the sake of example, if so far the state of alarm in Spain is expected to end so far up on the 9th, uh, 9th of May, uh, uh, it is possible to apply for a temporary layoff based on business rounds, based on productive reasons, and to have a temporary scope for that for two, three, four, or even six months beyond the end of the state of alarm. So, social security contributions are not a cost saving on this alternative, but it is possible to extend the cost savings for the salaries very well beyond the end of the state of emergency. Um, a couple of more um, important points for the new legislation that has been uh, impacted, that has been implemented in response of COVID-19 is in terms of dismissals. Um, it, 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 there's been, um, in other countries, there's been also some discussion as to whether uh, in response to COVID-19 there's been a, a full prohibition of dismissals. In Spain, there is not a full prohibition of dismissals. What we have in place is a prohibition to carry out a genuine redundancy process, which is a redundancy process whereby the employee's position is eliminated and the employees are entitled to a reduced redundancy payment. 
This is actually prohibited to the extent that it is made in response to COVID-19. But the companies are still able to terminate contracts of employment, not via redundancy situation, not via genuine redundancy situation, but we are via to what we call a termination without cost, which is simply to terminate employment uh, and offering the employee the statutory severance applicable for a termination without cost which for those of you who are not familiar with that process, it is a sub 33 days of salary per year of service. So it is a full prohibition, the answer is no. It is a partial prohibition, the answer is yes, because it prevents companies from implementing a redundancy situation in response of COVID-19, but companies are still able to carry out dismissals, not without reduced payments, by offering the employees the statutory severance applicable for a termination without cost. And there is a second point on this missiles that will be the last point of my um, uh, presentation, which is whether the companies have to maintain the same levels of employment if they have applied for a government funded program. And this is a still uh, a new legislation, a new piece of legislation that has also been implemented in response to COVID, which basically says if the company has uh, received some government funding from either, particularly from the uh, force major temporary layoff, and has received some exemption from social security, and the employees have received employment benefits, the companies must commit to continue to maintain the same number of employees six months after the end of the state of alarm. Uh, we still uh, have some uncertainties as to what this might mean, but essentially what we have to be aware is that if uh, our company applies for a government funded program, we will have to continue and to keep the same level of employees uh, six months following the end of the state of alarm, or alternatively, we would have to provision those damages or those payments that we would need to return back to the government funded programs uh, in response to the redundancies or in response to the terminations that we would need to make. Um, and on that respect, particularly if we are not able to keep the same level of employees six months after the end of the state of alarm. So basically, the government funding program is conditioned upon a compromise to keep the same level of employees six months after the state of alarm. But again, this is not a full prohibition, and it will be possible to conduct certain redundancies in the future, even within the six month threshold process. But of course, that would have to be in consideration to the return of the government funding program that has been made available to the company uh, from this petition that we uh, discussed before. So that was essentially um, the major points that um, I wanted to discuss in terms of the temporary layoff programs or the uh, prohibition of redundancies um, in the workplace. I don't know how many of you would like to add any further points um, on, on the presentation as a sort of a final recap to the audience. Sure, Juan, thank you very much. Uh, regarding the, the cost the co saving that, that you just mentioned, just a, a couple of points that they're worth to mention. First of all, is the obligation to manage un unemployment benefits uh, uh, from, from the company. Basically, um, as a consequence of the exceptional measure that has have been introduced by the Spanish government, the Spanish government has imposed the obligation for employees to request collectively the employment benefits for all those employees that are affected by a temporary layoff. This applies in both cases, uh, ERTES based uh, on force majeure, but also on temporary layoffs based on business related uh, grounds. They have five days to, to, to file this collective uh, request. Five days from the filing of the authorization of the uh, temporary redundancy plan, if it's based on force major, and five days from the from the end of the negotiation period in case of temporary layoff based on business related grounds. Other important points that we will want you to to talk about is there are the social security benefits that has that have been introduced by the Spanish government. 
There are two. There are two mor mor moratorium on social security contributions. The, the Spanish government has introduced an extraordinary mor moratorium up to uh, six month six month interest free. This would apply to contributions accrued between April and June 2020, and they are subject uh, that the company ha is not suspended their activity uh, due to the state of emergency. This is true that the, um, the law that introduced this moratorium foresees that the requirements will be developed by the Spanish government, and we are still waiting for that development. So further requirements will be uh, put in place in the, in the coming weeks. And the other uh, benefit that has been introduced from the social security perspective is the deferral on social security debts. This will apply also to debts accrued between April and June 2020. And the requirement that the Spanish law um, says is that there are not any prior deferral uh, granted uh, or enforced uh, by the Spanish social security. In such case, the benefit that has been introduced is that the interest that would accrue in case of this deferral will be of 0.5% instead of the uh, interest uh, applicable for the, for the ordinary debts in Spain. And basically, there, are, there have been the points that uh, both Juan and I want to talk to you about. Uh, we hope that you have found them interesting. Uh, if you have any comments, that would, um, just uh, address to the email address that uh, Juan said before. I don't know, Juan, if you want to add something else. No, thank you very much again, Jaime. Uh, just my only point, um, Anna, uh, I don't know if there's been any, any question that has been um, highlighted or that has been posed uh, while we were presenting. Uh, only if it might make sense to um, provide for a quick answer um, right now, um, or, or otherwise, uh, of course, you are more than welcome to um, ask any questions to us um, through the uh, email address that, that has been made um, to that respect. We will, we will, of course, do our best to answer them as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Juan and Jaime. Uh, um, I was just saying that since there are a couple of questions and we are already out of time because it's already 25 to, I think that we will address each question individually to the to the to the people po uh, posting them and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Please uh, do not hesitate to contact us should you need any clarifications. And besides, uh, let me inform you that the firm has put together a multitasking group of uh, regarding COVID to which you can address your queries. Uh, it's queries.covid19 at cuatrecasas.com. And if you have any questions, not uh, only regarding employment law, but any other area of practice, please do not hesitate to contact us. We will be very happy to assist you on any issue you may have. And thanks again for joining us today. And please keep safe, as Juan and Jaime have already told you, and stay at home. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much.